As I walk off into the city streets, a final word to the men and women of the Reagan Revolution, the men and women across America who for eight years did the work that brought America back. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger. We made the city freer. And we left her in good hands. All in all, not bad. Not bad at all. And so, goodbye, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Hi, I'm Melissa, and welcome to this month's Live from at the Reagan Library. Remember, we do this on the first Wednesday of every month. Today is June 7th, and just two days ago on June 5th, we commemorated the 19th anniversary of the passing of President Ronald Wilson Reagan. As such, we're going to spend today's live from going over the events from 19 years ago, as well as listening to some of the excerpts of the eulogies from his two funerals. Now here at the Reagan Library and the Reagan Foundation and Institute, we choose not to mourn the death of President Reagan. Instead, we celebrate his life. Now, I have shared this with you before, but when President Reagan was choosing a location for his presidential library, he specifically fell in love with the view top and vistas of this Reagan Library campus and specifically chose this location, which is the west side of our campus, for his memorial site. This location is home to views of the Pacific Ocean, views of gorgeous Southern California sunsets, views of horse trails, and views of an endless California sky. Now, on June 5, 2004, at the age of 93, with his wife and his family by his side, President Reagan passed away. And on June 7, so 19 years ago today, his casket came to the Reagan Library and lay in repose in the Reagan Library's main lobby. Mourners from all walks of life and from around the nation came to the Reagan Library to pay their final respects to the President. Over the course of 30 hours, 118,000 people waited in line for hours to pay their final respects to the president. Then, two days later on June 9th, the casket flew to um, Washington, D.C. via Air Force One, flew into Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, then uh, via motorcade went to the ellipse near the White House, and finally, with a horse-drawn caisson, was taken to the U.S. Capitol there is casket lay in state uh, where another 105,000 people came to pay their respects. Then finally on June 11th at 10.30 in the morning Eastern time, uh, the casket was taken via motorcade to the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. There the state funeral was held. The state funeral was broadcast all around the world and dignitaries from 165 different nations came to the funeral. At that funeral, eulogies were given by a handful of people. We're going to now listen to excerpts from a handful. Let's start with President Reagan's ally and his friend, former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. We have lost a great president, a great American, and a great man. And I have lost a dear friend. But we have one beacon to guide us that Ronald Reagan never had. We have his example. Let us give thanks today for a life that achieved so much for all of God's children. Another eulogy uh, we'll listen to some excerpts from is former Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney. One saw the quintessential Ronald Reagan, the leader we respected, the neighbor we admired, and the friend we loved, a president of the United States of America, whose truly remarkable life we celebrate in this magnificent cathedral today. The vast difference between the job of president and the role of president. Ronald Reagan fulfilled both with elegance and ease, embodying himself that unusual alchemy of history and tradition and achievement an inspirational conduct and national pride that define the special role the President of the United States of America must assume at all times, at home and around the world. La nation de l'État. No one understood it better than Ronald Reagan, 
and no one could more eloquently summon his nation to high purpose or bring forth the majesty of the presidency and make it glow better than the man who referred to his own nation as a city on the hill. I have been truly blessed to have been a friend of Ronald Reagan. I am grateful that our paths crossed and that our lives touched. I shall always remember him with the deepest admiration and affection. And I will always feel honored by the journey that we traveled together. And lastly, from his state funeral, let's listen to some excerpts of the eulogy from President Reagan's friend, his partner, his vice president, former president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, who spoke so warmly and from the heart. As his vice president for eight years, I learned more from Ronald Reagan than from anyone I encountered in all my years of public life. I learned kindness. We all did. I also learned courage, the nation did. And then I learned decency, the whole world did. Humility goes before honor, and our friend had both. And who could not cherish such a man? Then at around 1.30 in the afternoon on June 11th, the casket was moved for its final time. It came back to California via Air Force One to Point Magoo Naval Air Base in Ventura County for the final interment ceremony here at the Reagan Library. Uh, from Point Magoo Naval Air Base to the Reagan Library, hundreds and thousands of Americans lined the streets to watch the final uh, funeral procession go by and to pay their final respects. The motorcade got to the Reagan Library around sunset on June 11th. That ceremony was also broadcast around the world, and eulogies were given by all three of his children. Let's start by listening to the eulogy from his son, Michael. You knew my father as governor, as president, but I knew him as dad. At the early onset of Alzheimer's disease, my father and I would tell each other we loved each other, and we give each other a hug. As the years went by and he could no longer verbalize my name, he recognized me as the man who hugged him. And so when I would walk into the house, he would be there in his chair, opening up his arms for that hug, hello, and the hug goodbye. Next, let's listen to some excerpts from the eulogy from his daughter, Patty. Many years ago, my father, decided to write down his reflections about death, specifically his own, and how he would want people to feel about it. He chose to write down the first verse of an Alfred Lord Tennyson poem, Crossing the Bar, and then he decided to add a couple of lines of his own. I don't think Tennyson will mind. In fact, they've probably already discussed it by now. Tennyson wrote, Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. My father added, we have God's promise that I have gone on to a better world where there is no pain or sorrow. Bring comfort to those who may mourn my going. I don't know why Alzheimer's was allowed to steal so much of my father. <clears throat> Sorry before releasing him into the arms of death. But I know that at his last moment, when he opened his eyes, eyes that had not opened for many, many days, and looked at my mother, he showed us that neither disease nor death can conquer love. And lastly, let's listen to some excerpts from the eulogies from President Reagan's other son, Ron. He is home now. He is free. In his final letter to the American people, Dad wrote, I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. This evening, he has arrived. History will record his worth as a leader. We here have long since measured his worth as a man. Honest, compassionate, graceful, brave. He was the most 
plainly decent man you could ever hope to meet. Visitors to the Reagan Library can come here right where I'm standing and visit the memorial site. This is the memorial site to both President and Mrs. Reagan, and you can come and spend as much time as you'd like to pay your respects. We want to thank you so much for joining us today, and we do want to ask, you know, whether you're watching this today or next week or never, let's just take a moment to reflect on President Reagan's life and legacy. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. I, too, have been described as an undying optimist, always seeing a glass half full when some see it as half empty. And yes, it's true. I always see the sunny side of life. And that's not just because I've been blessed by achieving so many of my dreams. My optimism comes not just from my strong faith in God, but from my strong and enduring faith in man. In my 80 years, I prefer to call that the 41st anniversary of my 39th birthday, I've seen what men can do for each other and do to each other. I've seen war and peace, feast and famine, depression and prosperity, sickness and health. I've seen the depths of suffering and the peaks of triumph. And I know in my heart that man is good, that what is right will always eventually triumph, and that there is purpose and worth to each and every life.